It's 8 p.m. on D-Day, and in this hour, just west of Gold Beach, Arrow Manch is cleared of the enemy by the Hampshires, and this they manage without taking a single casualty. This is extremely important. It is at Aromanche that the Allies will locate their Mulberry Harbors, huge sinkable concrete caissons that are already on their way across the channel. It is the Mulberry Harbors that have allowed Eisenhower to choose this stretch of coast for the invasion. Normally, a deep water harbor would have been one of the first things to capture so that reinforcement of new equipment can follow for the rest of Operation Overlord. The Mulberry Harbor provides a semi-deep water harbor and allows the Allies more time to capture Chabourg or Le Havre, for instance. As we move into evening, the situation at Omaha is finally a bit relieved, but far from stable. The D3 draw is finally recorded as open at 8.30 p.m. A captain from the 116th Service Company walks down from Saint Laurent to meet vehicles that can drive up from the beach. Now, Canham's 116th Infantry is pretty scattered. Headquarters and the 1st Battalion are in and around Vierville, and 2nd and 3rd Battalions are in the vicinity of Saint Laurent. Slappy's 115th Infantry is east of Saint Laurent, but still can't break into the town, and the Germans block the landward side of the E3 draw. A lot of the reserve, the 175th, is still floating around out there, as is 5th Corps reserve armor, the 747th Tank Battalion. The situation is even more precarious for the 82nd Airborne on Cotentin, as the Germans continue to see the Airborne as their primary target. By the evening of D-Day, the paratroopers still hold the bridges over the Merdere River, two miles west of San Meraglise. The Germans are there, right on the other side, pestering the defenders with mortars and small arms. But overall, it's a bunch of smaller stalemates like at Lafayette Bridge, where neither side dares to attempt a crossing, knowing they will pay heavily for it. James Gavin, who has become the de facto commander of all American troops at the Merdere Front, has a dilemma. Holding on to his gains and, and waiting until reinforcements begin arriving seems like the smartest thing to do, but he is also well aware that there are a lot of American paratroopers trapped in smaller pockets on either side of the river fighting for their lives. But there is simply no reasonable way Gavin can launch a rescue mission anytime soon without endangering his whole front. As the sun moves slowly towards the horizon, the trapped paratroopers on either side of the Mer de Ray have no choice but to stay put and try to fight off the noose tightening around them. There are three major holdouts. The first is about one and a half kilometers northwest of Lafayette Bridge, under Charles Timms of the 507th. Around 200 men have entrenched themselves inside an apple orchard on the fringes of the swamp. Timms has no radio and no means of contacting the others or finding out what's happening on the other side of the river. All he knows is that the German mortar fire is increasing and the casualties are mounting. Three kilometers south of him, at a place called Hill 30, another even larger group of lost paratroopers prepare for the night. Hill 30 is marked on their maps as a major strategic location, but it turns out to be just an unremarkable hill in the middle of nowhere at least for the time being. Led astray, these men under Thomas Shanley are isolated and circled and with their backs to the swamps. Shanley does have a radio, but this only lets him know there is no help arriving anytime soon. As the Germans begin closing in on three sides, Shanley and company can only dig in and hope that their supplies and ammunition do not run out before help arrives. The third group, more than six kilometers west of San Maraglis, is in an even worse position. Boxed in among the bocage near the village of Amfreville, these lost paratroopers, led by George Millet of the 507, are trapped in a row of fields surrounded by the enemy. Without hope of rescue, they prepare to sell their lives as dearly as possible as the Germans begin closing the noose here as well. At Hillman, it is the Germans that are under pressure, but they are putting up one hell of a fight against the odds. The attacks on Hillman have been rearranged so that two eight-gun batteries of 25-pounders, a flail tank, and a squadron of tanks each from the Hussars and the Yeomanry could really get to work. This really should have been a target more for a whole battalion at least 
and not just a couple of companies without heavy backup. Covered by tank fire, artillery, mortars, and smoke, Royal Engineers crawled into the minefield and eventually realized they were dealing with obsolete British Mark III landmines, stock captured at Dunkirk. Following the flail, three Shermans led through the gap and the Suffolk started to mop up the position. Intense machine gun fire still held them back until Private Jim Titch Hunter of 8th Platoon decided to charge the main bunker, jumping into the trench network, all the while firing his Bren gun from the hip. His mates started to thrust grenades and smoke bombs down the ventilation shafts of each position. The defenders started to surrender. At 8.15, after blowing bunkers up with charges placed right against their entrances, the Hillman position has been overcome. Well, not entirely, as it turns out. Krug and a bunch of his men are still in underground rooms that the British are unaware of. Krug has been watching the action through a periscope in contact with Richter in Cannes the whole time. He asks Richter over the phone, Herr General, the enemy are on top of my bunker. They are demanding my surrender. I have no means of resisting and no contact with my own men. What am I to do? Richter says, I can no longer give you any orders. You must act on your own judgment. Auf Wiedersehen. Thing is, Krug is not asking out of defeat. He is a veteran of both the Great War and the Eastern Front in this war. And oftentimes, in such a situation, what you do is just sit tight and wait for the cavalry to turn up. Well, well maybe not the actual cavalry, but you know what I mean. Krug is asking Richter when there will be a counterattack. Richter just basically punts and says, nothing to do with me. Peering into the future. Tomorrow morning at 6.45, Krug will surprise the Suffolks by suddenly appearing in pristine condition with two junior officers and 70 men and his manservant and surrendering to Lieutenant Colonel Richard Goodwin, 1st Suffolk's commander. He was the first senior officer to fall into Allied hands on D-Day, and once it was assessed he was no Nazi, but simply an experienced officer doing his job, was treated with great respect for the sheer professionalism of his defense over nearly 24 hours. But wait, back to Private Titch Hunter and today for a second. He is nominated by Goodwin for an immediate military medal. He is actually also the biggest problem child of the battalion. He was even thrown out of the Norfolks back before the invasion. But it was he today who kick-started the final attack on Hillman, and Edward Cass, commanding 3rd Division, upgrades the medal recommendation to one for the Distinguished Conduct Medal. Point of order, Edward Cass that I just mentioned is not yet commanding 3rd Division. He gets that command next week. Now that the fighting has somewhat slowed down in many places, although many civilians have gone about their business despite the fighting earlier, more and more French civilians begin to come out and greet the new invaders. Now, you may remember from previously in the day when Indy spoke of civilians waiting for a bus while the battle for the beach raged only a hundred meters away. The café in Bernier that was open and selling wine. How Monsieur Gondry at Benoville Bridge came out with champagne for the British paratroopers. Or the story of how the U.S. Airborne discovered Calvados in the homes of farmers. Here's another such story by BBC correspondent Richard Dimbleby, one of the journalists flying along the fighting at Gold Juno and Sword Beaches. Long stretches of empty roads shining with rain, deserted dripping woods and damp fields, static quiet, perhaps uncannily quiet, and possibly not to remain quiet. But here and there a movement catches the eye as our aircraft on reconnaissance roar over a large and suspicious wood. Three German soldiers running like mad across the main road to fling themselves into cover. And nearer the battle area, much nearer the battle area than they, a solitary peasant harrowing his field, up and down behind the horses, looking nowhere but before him and at the soil. We can take away two things from that story. First, the astonishing life-goes-on attitude of that farmer becomes more understandable when you think of the context. That field must be harrowed, otherwise the produce will be spoiled. Who knows when this will be over, might as well do it now. Perhaps there is also a coping mechanism connected to it. Better keep busy while risk getting killed than to just hunker down scared and still risk getting killed. Second, we've said it before, I'll say it again. 
Our perception of what this battle looks like is skewed by our inability to see the big picture. In the course of the day, there will altogether be about 200,000 men fighting from both sides today. The two departements they are fighting in, Manche and Calvados, are 10,000 square kilometers. Even if you took all the men and spread them over the entire area, that would be 20 men per square kilometer. But they are not even that spread out. Most are fighting at choke points, bridgeheads, and along the beaches. Sure, the airborne are all over, but still the actual fighting is concentrated to roads, bridges, and tactically important settlements. In 2023, Manche and Calvados will have over a million inhabitants, and they are major tourist attractions. Still, on any given day, even in the high tourist summer season, when you go inland to the fields, drive the country roads through the villages, you will see very few human beings, because 10,000 square kilometers is a really big area. It's different in the towns, of course, and it is here that most of the civilian deaths occur. The vast majority by Allied bombing. Now at 8 p.m., the Allies begin a series of recurring bombings of Saint Lô at the edge of today's battlefield. Yesterday, June 5th, the USAAF successfully precision bombed the railway station there. Despite leaflets and radio warnings that come in today, the pinpoint targeting of yesterday's attack has lulled the citizens into a false sense of security. Today is very different, though as the heavy bombers come in and pretty much raise St. Lou with the ground. Windows and doors flew across rooms, one citizen recalled. The grandfather clock fell flat, tables and chairs danced a ballet. Terrorized families fled to their cellars and a number were buried alive. Old soldiers from the First World War refused to shelter underground. They had seen too many comrades suffocate under the earth of bombarded trenches. The air became choking with dust from smashed masonry. During this Night of the Great Nightmare, they saw the double spires of the small cathedral silhouetted against the flames. Some burst into tears at the sight of their ruined town. Four members of the resistance from Cherbourg were killed in the prison. The headquarters of the Gendarmerie, the Caserne Bellevue, was completely destroyed. Well over half the houses in the town were razed to the ground. Doctors and aid workers could do little, so wounds were disinfected with Calvados. Accelerated by the vibration from the bombing, one heavily pregnant woman went straight into labor and a baby girl was born right in the apocalypse. As soon as the air raids started, many had instinctively run out into the countryside where they sought shelter in barns and farmyards. When they finally summoned the courage to return to saint Lou, they were horrified by the smell of corpses still buried beneath the ruins. Some 300 civilians had died. Normandy, they had discovered, was to be the sacrificial lamb for the liberation of France. Now, Mr. Beaver uses the word liberation, and it truly is for some Frenchmen, but after the war, the story will become that it's liberation for everyone. That is not quite how it looks on June 6, 1944. Sure, the German occupiers are viewed to most Frenchmen as a foreign body, and like the resistance is a small portion of the population, so is the active collaborators, both of these groups are, like in most of occupied Europe, in the lower single-digit percentages. The vast majority of people are simply getting on with their lives trying to survive. Politically, France is very complicated. There are large groups that sympathize with Pétain and the Vichy government, people who to some degree feel that Germany is a closer ally than any of the Western allies. There is a historical animosity to the English. Like in all of Europe, there is a significant number of anti-Semites who agree with the same mythology of hatred that Nazism is founded on. There are large groups fundamentally opposed to Bolshevism and, by extension, fearful of the United Nations alliance. Conversely, there are groups sympathetic to Bolshevism who, until the summer of 41, were either supportive or at least accepting of the Nazi-Soviet alliance, but are now opposed to Nazism and, by extension, supportive of the United Nations alliance. Finally, there are those who support de Gaulle and those who hate de Gaulle. In short, the invasion is not unilaterally seen as a liberation. To many, it is the replacement of one invader by a new invader. To others, it is the threat of a communist uprising that might follow the invasion. To some, it is the promise of the same uprising. To a few, it is the defeat of the principles of fascism and anti-Semitism they themselves espouse. 
But one thing is true for almost every Frenchman, like it is for all of the world. The invasion gives them hope that soon this terrible war may be over. And perhaps it is the expression of that joy that posterity will mistake for a joy of seeing specifically the United Nations Alliance troops march into their town. It is not liberation from a specific power, but liberation from fear and uncertainty. In Bernier-sur-Mer, at around this time, the people are celebrating exactly that. Fifteen-year-old Marguerite will forever be haunted by seeing all the dead soldiers on the beach, and she will especially remember the horror of a dead, disfigured, young German not much older than herself. Seventy years later, she will say, It's impossible to look at the sea without thinking of that. That German soldier had parents. But in the end, it is the joy of having survived, hoping that it is over, and the feeling that the Allies bring security that seizes her and everyone else. I came out in the street. It was amazing. We could see huge tanks and soldiers everywhere. It was absolutely wonderful. One of the Allied troops found a house with a piano, rolled it outside, and started playing. We danced in the streets with the soldiers. The people in the village were so happy, so happy to be alive. And through whatever distorted lens we may remember this war, let us not forget that what the Nazis brought with them through the war of conquest they waged was exactly that, fear, uncertainty, and hatred. That is what the Allies begin liberating France from today. We've talked of the preparations for today, and we've talked of misconceptions about this day. And there is one place that comes together, the Dieppe Parade in 1942. It's often mentioned as like a dry run for today. Many also consider it a folly of military hubris that cost unnecessary lives. It is, in fact, neither a dry run for D-Day, nor was it a folly. It was a tragic failure, and it did cost many lives, especially Canadian soldiers. But like Fortitude is for today, the Dieppe raid was for the Atlantic War, a huge strategically significant deception. We asked Paul to clear up the fog around this event with one of the, if not the, expert historian on Dieppe, David O'Keefe. Go, David. David, it's good to talk again, as it always is. Operation Overlord, of course, required a huge amount of planning and preparation. How important was the Dieppe raid in that planning and preparation? Because we've been led to believe it was really significant. Well, actually, I, that's one of the big myths about the Normandy invasion, is that there was a direct connection between Dieppe and Normandy. As a matter of fact, that's not the case. The Dieppe raid was very much what we call a one-day butcher and bolt raid. The architecture is completely different. You're coming across the channel in 1942 to raid for a couple of hours. You're not there to establish a bit bridgehead, build up a bridgehead, and then break out and conquer Europe. That's what you're doing in 1944. Also, Dieppe itself is a tiny little port that would have been rather insignificant for building up an army. So immediately, we have a different form or a different architecture for the raid. So in other words, you know, this is very much a one day butcher and bolt and the other one is a full blown invasion. They're completely separate beasts. So we've always looked at this or Dieppe as a precursor to learn lessons that were then applied in Normandy. But that's not necessarily the case because lessons for amphibious operations had been known before the war. And of course, were being perfected in the invasions of Sicily and Italy and in the Pacific. These were actual invasions where you build up and you break out not just a simple raid as Dieppe was, or at least was intended to be. But with that said, there's much more about Dieppe than meets the eye. Right. The Dieppe raid, obviously, we're looking at it. You made that point a second ago. It's part of this series of amphibious raids of various size, including eventually the Second Front in Overlords in June 44. There are other events happening at the same time that are very important in this whole process, one being the Battle of the Atlantic. So how does that tie in with Dieppe? Well, of course, this is one aspect of the Dieppe historiography that we've never thought about before. But when you step back and you think about it, there's no way you can plan an invasion of Europe unless you secure the vital Atlantic lifeline. This is the precursor for everything. If you don't win the Battle of the Atlantic, 
then you don't get a chance to move ships, material, manpower across the Atlantic to England. And then, of course, over onto the continent. There's no way you can project your power until you win the Battle of the Atlantic. So really, this is what Dieppe was all about, the Battle of the Atlantic. You're absolutely right. Without the sinews of war, without the numbers of landing craft, without the numbers of personnel, the ammunition, we can't mount a second front. And that depends on the supplies and that depends on the Battle of the Atlantic. But in 1942, especially in the spring period, how was that battle going? Well, the Battle of the Atlantic and the war at sea in general is pretty much of a roller coaster ride in the first few years of the war. And for a while, you know, the Germans have the upper hand and the British gain the upper hand. Then, of course, the, you know, the Germans get it again. And largely that comes down to the ability to break codes and know exactly where your enemy is at a given time. Um, the code name that they give to this, of course, is Ultra. It is above top secret. The fruits of code breakers that were, or code breaking that was happening at Bletchley Park was given this particular code name and it was so secret. But it was extremely important. It's kind of like cheating in a poker game when you can read your opponent's hand. Just think how well you're going to do. You may not be able to predict what cards are coming up, but at least you'll know how to react when you see them in their hands. And that's what the Allies are doing. They're using code breaking as the ultimate force enhancer to help them win the war at sea and the Battle of the Atlantic in particular. Right. And this, of course, a favorite line with these productions is nothing happens in a vacuum. And that ability to predict, make some preparations in terms of what's going to be happening in the Atlantic, what might the Germans be doing, so therefore how can we best manipulate that advantage by moving our convoys a particular way or using a particular route or something like that. That's that edge, that's fine margin that may make the difference between a convoy getting through and a convoy not getting through. And that ultra impact is something that we need to consider. Well, what we didn't know until there were significant declassifications about 10 years ago was that the British had been conducting what were called pinch operations. As a matter of fact, that meant stealing, stealing the type of material that code breakers at Bletchley Park would need to break into the new kind of enciphered communications that the Germans were using. And of course, this was based on the famous Enigma machine, two types of Enigma machines. One was a three rotor whose odds of breaking without captured material were 150 million, million, million to one. But when they introduced a new upgun version called the four rotor in 1942, those odds went up to an astronomical 92 septillion to one shot. So that's like winning a national lottery every single day for 150 straight years at least. So good luck. So as a result, you need captured material, but you have to capture material in a way that the Germans are not gonna suspect that you're actually after what you're after. So in 1941, they developed a way of doing this by raiding on shore. So they started up in the Lofoten Islands in Norway. They actually hit there twice. Then they took that to the Western part of France. Some of these raids had success. Some of them didn't when it came to pinching material. But the point was they had now created what was called a pinch doctrine, where they could pinch by opportunity, pinch by chance, and pinch by design. So whenever they had a problem, they would actually create a raid dress it up to look like something that it wasn't, and then go after that material. And that's exactly what Dieppe was. So essentially, David, what you're saying is, is that having had really good access, the four rotor suddenly means the Allies have less access and they need to get back the game in their favor again, hence why the pinch raids must be ramped up because we've got to get back to an even keel and find out what the Germans are doing and be able to uh, interpret their information to improve our chances? Without a doubt. I mean, there is a definite correlation between the success of Bletchley Park and the reduction in sinkings of Allied vessels and the effectiveness of the U-boats. There's no doubt about that. And that's part of the roller coaster ride. Anytime the British get in, they get the upper hand in the Battle of the Atlantic. Anytime they lose the ability to read codes, they drop down. And this is the game that's being played in the first three and a half years of the Second World War out in the Battle of the Atlantic. So you said yourself, Dieppe, it's not the biggest port on the French coast. It must therefore have something that makes it significant. What has it got? What treasure does Dieppe have that suddenly becomes important to the Allies? Well, first of all, Dieppe is doable. It's in a location where they can reach with all combined arms. They can have air, they can have Navy, and they can have ground forces. 
But more importantly, what it does is even though it's small, it's not necessarily insignificant when it comes to communications. As a matter of fact, all the ports, regardless of size, are all linked up in the same general communications net, which means they all need a stack of codes and cipher material. Meaning that if you raid one of these ports, you have the possibility of getting your hands on what Bletchley needs. And of course, the added value with Dieppe was this was the supply facility for the English Channel in this area, particularly of communications equipment. So if they're in the process of bringing out a brand new Enigma machine with all its associated material, which was really what they were after more than the machine itself, then this is the ultimate or potential ultimate pot of gold. So Dieppe has within it code books, Enigma machines, and all sorts of potential game-changing naval intelligence. So the Allies could just plan a raid by paratroopers or commandos, go in there, get that stuff, come back to England with it, and there they are, they've got the advantage. But why wouldn't that work, David? What the British were worried about was if they made the raid too small and too focused on the particular equipment and the material that they needed, the Germans would twig into this in a heartbeat. And then, of course, they would take steps to then change the various cipher material and the cipher systems that they were trying to break. So the idea was to use a larger cloak of a raid, which you could you know, you could claim it was anything. You could claim it was for PR. You could claim it was to learn lessons. You could claim it was to support the Russians. And they had done this earlier. They did this up in Norway. They did this on the west coast of France. Now they were doing it in the channel. So the idea was to basically baffle your enemy as to what you were after by making it so big that they would never suspect that at the core of it, this is what you were after. So I see how it's working now because you have this idea of getting this intelligence you need, but also the things you said there about gaining experience, coordinating uh, air, navy, and army forces, uh, giving something to Stalin to prove that the allies are, are capable of mounting something into France. These are secondary benefits, but they're also at the same time primary benefits in that they are, they are all legitimate things that are benefiting everybody. So the whole package in terms of everything can benefit the allies, but at its core, is this central idea of establishing an advantage in terms of naval intelligence. But the, of course, the burning question, David, is how do we know this? Well, I mean, that's well said. I mean, I think that's the idea. The idea is that when you have an engine that's on its way to Dieppe or like a train, you can load any passengers you want on it. And so as a result, yes, there are other legitimate or as you say, secondary um, um, imperatives that can be taken care of. But the reason we know this now is because there has been a significant release of material which shows that there was a commando unit specifically raised to pinch the kind of material that they were looking for and that it fits in kind of like um, a Russian nesting doll where you can see now with the operational orders that were given to those Royal Marine commandos and of course some of the ancillary documents of how they coordinated with the Canadians on that day Plus, adding to that, the material all about the fact that there was actually a playbook for this, a doctrine. This was not something that was just thrown on at the end. This was something the British had been developing since March of 1941. So as a result, they've had 18 months of experience developing pinch operations. But of course, unfortunately, sometimes when you're building a monster, you may end up with Frankenstein's monster instead. And that's kind of what we have at Dieppe and I'm going to take us now to 80 years plus on, is that the Dieppe raid was a catastrophic loss of life for Canadian personnel, British personnel as well. It deeply scarred and haunted the Canadian military and the Canadian psyche and continues to do so. So I can understand where post-war there was a need to have a really big, important reason to pin the Dieppe raid on, to make this loss of life more uh, palatable, in a sense, than actually at its core, being an intelligence gamble, which is important, but it's something that your average person perhaps doesn't really understand with the same ease they do a, an amphibious landing to gain an objective. You know, giving ourselves, as you said earlier, like a 5% advantage in the Battle of the Atlantic doesn't seem to be something that's war-winning. We can see now it's a huge, a huge benefit, but post-war, maybe it doesn't seem big enough. So did this influence how Dieppe was written and talked about for, for several generations? 
Well, very much. I think there are two salient factors that come in here. And one is exactly what you pointed out. In you know six hours, a thousand men died. Another three thousand ended up as prisoners or missing. I mean, it is a disaster, regardless of what the intent was. And of course, the people who were responsible for the planning, Lord Louis Mountbatten, his combined operations headquarters, they wanted to distance themselves as much as possible and seek some sort of you know uh, buffer, if you will, for those losses. So they were the ones who developed the whole concept of lessons learned, and this was necessary to support the Russians, the, anything that they could. But more importantly was the fact that what we can talk about now, the idea of code breaking, was all classified until the early 1980s. And then it, at that point, it was only the tip of the iceberg. Now, finally, all these years later, 80 years later, we're now finally getting our hands on all the files from the code breakers. So we can sit back and actually assess, oh my God, this was incredibly important for the Allied war effort. Whereas in 1942, in the days following the raid, you couldn't use that at all. You couldn't even mention anything to do with intelligence because it was ultra secret at the time. So that those two salient factors are the reasons why we have developed our understanding of Dieppe to where it is or where it was until today. That makes perfect sense, David, that the post-war narrative needed to be as it was. But there are some people that have looked at your work, uh, both in documentaries and with your book, and I shall hold up a copy of your book, folks. There we have it, One Day in August. Is that it has this level of conspiracy. Oh, it's just a theory. Here's a crackpot with a new idea going against things. But it's not like you're suggesting the earth is flat or something crazy like this. You are someone who has spent an inordinate, crazy amount of time in the archives looking at documents. I think you said to me 30,000 pages of archives. So where is this information? Where did you find it? And was there a single eureka moment or was it a series of small victories that led you to the conclusion you now have? Well, first of all, you're right. I mean, this is the most comprehensive study on Dieppe that's ever been undertaken. It took me 15 years for the initial book to come out. And then I put another 10 years in for a second edition, which is the one you're holding up. And as a result, it wasn't just 30,000 pages. It's now roughly about 170,000 pages of material. And of course, that's amazing what historians can do in this day and age with digitization, the amount of material that we can go through. Well, that's what it took to actually look at Dieppe. And all I did was go in and strip Dieppe right down, forget about all the hindsight arguments, and just go back to the actual primary source documents and then build it back up to see where it led. And sure enough, this is exactly where it led. So this is not some sort of crackpot theory. This is not anything like those. This is the most comprehensive study that's ever been done on this operation. And these are the results whether you like them or not. <laughs> These are the results at the end of the day. So we've discussed the idea of hiding the pinch raid within a much larger amphibious raid, but take us through what the actual plan was for this small commando team who was specifically trained to do this work. What, where were they coming from? What were they trying to get, do? How are they going to get there? And how are they going to get out? And more importantly, what went wrong and how did it actually unfold? Well, the plan was for a group of Royal Marine Commandos. Uh, they, they were called X Platoon. They were part of Royal Marine A Commando, which would later go on to split into the 40 Royal Marine Commando and 30th Assault Unit, which was the intelligence gathering unit created by Ian Fleming. Well, as a result, they were supposed to ride in to Dieppe Harbor on the back of HMS Locust, which was a gunboat that they were going to use to blast their way into the harbor. In cooperation, with the Canadian armor, the Canadian infantry, and the Canadian engineers who were all working together in concert to create the conditions in the harbor for these commandos to get to their objective. Their objective was two. They, they had two objectives. One was the Hotel Moderne, which they believed was naval headquarters, German naval headquarters, and as such would have the kind of material, or at least in theory, would have the kind of material that they were looking for. The other thing was all the ships that were in the harbor all contained or sus were suspected of containing the new material. Plus there was a supply depot next to the ships. So the idea was to come in on the back of the Locust, all guns blazing if necessary, and land, hit those targets, 
capture the information or the equipment or the material that they needed. And then, and this is a very interesting part, there was actually a pipeline to get that information out. So you had an infiltration plan and an exfiltration plan. And right in the middle of the battle, they were going to send in a what they call an arbo, basically a speedboat. And they were going to load all the material on there. And then it was going to be taken back out to one of the command destroyers offshore. On board was Ian Fleming, the commander of the unit, or at least the architect of the unit, who was then going to act kind of like, um, I guess you could say, the anchor man in a relay. And he was going to break off in the middle of battle and go to the closest British port to bring the material back. So you can see right from the start, and by the way, this was the first element that was in the Dieppe operation when it was conceived in late March, early April of 1942. Everything that came later in the operation was built up around these Royal Marines on the back of HMS Locust. So you know the pinch is in right from conception and it goes right through right to the end. Now, on the day, on the day, all hell was breaking loose. The plan, which wasn't the best plan to say the least, started to collapse almost immediately. The Royal Marines who were offshore tried on three different times to get into the harbor, but the Germans still commanded the headlands on each side. So they were able to bring down heavy artillery onto the ship as it was trying to get in. They were worried about being sunk out in the channel. So a decision was made to take the Royal Marines off of Locust, put them into landing craft, just like the Canadian infantry had got in and they were going to follow the Canadian infantry in as sort of a third or a fourth wave of the attack. Well, sadly, just like what happened to the Canadians in the first couple of waves, the same thing happened to the Royal Marines. They paid a heavy price and the commando unit never reached the shore. They got close, their landing craft was hit and they ended up jumping into the English Channel and then having to make a decision. Do they swim to shore and be captured? which was not something they wanted to do, given the fact of what they were there to do. So they all decided they were going to swim back out into the English Channel and risk death to be able to keep the secret. Most of them were indeed picked up, uh, but there were a few of them that died and um, they ended up getting back. And as far as we know, none of this ever leaked out until it was finally declassified back in 2012. I can't help noticing, David, you threw in the name there, Ian Fleming. This is the Ian Fleming from James Bond fame. He's the architect of this? Yes, without a doubt, it is the Ian Fleming of James Bond fame. And of course, that was kind of like the, the ultimate rabbit hole for me because I had to figure out who Fleming was. We hear about Fleming in all different aspects. He was James Bond. He wasn't anything. He was just a, you know, some backroom officer at Naval Intelligence. Well, that wasn't necessarily the case. He wasn't James Bond, but he was much more important than just a faceless bureaucrat. He was the personal assistant to the director of Naval Intelligence who took on the portfolio for liaisoning with everyone from the Americans to all aspects of British intelligence and Bletchley Park. And more importantly, he was the one responsible for overseeing pinch operations. So as a result, he does have his finger in the pie when it comes to Dieppe, particularly the creation of the commando unit that was there specifically to pinch the material. So having been there myself with staying in fact opposite the Hotel Modern and looking at the harbor there and looking at the access, it's hard to assess whether or not this plan was going to work or not, because part of it seems ridiculously ambitious and part of it seems almost easy in that the harbor and the building is right beside there. The, once you get once you get to that harbor, the buildings are right there. Maybe getting out again is a potential problem. But now in the aftermath of all this, with tanks being stuck in the streets, with infantry being slain here and there, and you've got the, you the other beaches a few miles east and west, it's hard to break it down and see where did this plan go wrong? And I think that's where it's difficult with the benefit of hindsight to kind of separate these events and go back to, as you said yourself, that right at its inception, the pinch raid was integral to this. In fact, everything else was built around it. So it is, I can understand why people find it difficult to analyze it all these years later with so many moving parts. 
Well, I think the big failure of Dieppe really is not necessarily on the day. It would be in the concept. Because although the idea of Dieppe, of going in and pinching material that will help win the Battle of the Atlantic and make sure that you have the upper hand on the German Navy moving forward, is altruistic. It's incredible. It's wonderful. But the methodology adopted left a lot to be desired. And of course, now, sitting back and looking at the real lessons of Dieppe, this is something that needs to be taken into account. So as a result now, I mean, they spent an enormous amount of time trying to gain surprise so they'd be able to capture the material before it was destroyed. But by doing so, they threw the entire plan off kilter. And that was the key. More importantly, there were no lifeguards, if you will, uh, watching the pool at Mountbatten's headquarters, meaning there were no contingencies or very few. There were no, um, you know, what ifs? What if this doesn't work? What if that doesn't work? There was no dissent by this time in Mountbatten's headquarters. They were suffering from what we call victory disease. In other words, all the earlier pinch raids, if they hadn't captured the material, they at least were not bloodbaths. As a matter of fact, very few of them took heavy casualties or casualties at all. So as a result, there was this attitude that, well, nothing's gone wrong before. Why would it now? And so as a result now, they were moving on this hubris, moving on the, with this arrogance, if you will, that they were going to get away with it no matter what. And as such, they started to cut corners. They started to basically plan operations and plan various tactics that they were going to bring in without proper assessments. Nobody was there to stress test it. And so unfortunately on the day, despite the great intentions, the entire architecture of the raid was off to start with. And very quickly, the whole thing started to snowball downhill. So we have this disaster. The raid is not a success, massive loss of life due to a lack of thorough preparation, a bit of overconfidence. And yet somehow out of this, beyond of this, going it, Bringing it back to the Battle of the Atlantic, the Allies find themselves with exactly what they need in a completely random situation later in 1942. So to conclude this, what was the lucky break they got that did turn things for the Allies? When you're thinking about the four rotor and the enormous odds, you've got to think about it from the British perspective. They are looking at kind of like the pandemic and a spreading disease. The four rotor is moving now out to U-boats in the Atlantic. But now, in March of 1942, they find out that surface vessels, particularly in the channel and operating out of Dieppe, are also carrying the four-rotor, the new four-rotor machine. So it's not just U-boats out in the Atlantic. The entire Kriegsmarine, the entire German Navy, is now moving to this new machine. I guess the great irony in all this is what was the four-rotor enigma was actually solved by what we call a chance capture. That happened in the fall of 1942 when a U-boat was captured in the Mediterranean and it coughed up its four-rotor secrets. But at that point, that was kind of like winning the lottery. In other words, you can't survive by not having a job and hoping you're going to win the lottery every week. So basically, the Dieppe operation and in the earlier pinch operations were ensuring you had a paycheck every couple of weeks as opposed to hoping somewhere down the line you were going to get lucky. But in this particular case, in the fall of 1942, fate intervened and they were able to get what they needed from that U-boat. Does that then pretty much bring an end to the pinch concept because they've got what they need now and naval intelligence takes a different route and our interest in this story kind of yeah. takes a different route and we, we then start moving back to the original purpose of this conversation, which was talk about the preparation for D-Day. So is that yeah. is that where this story kind of uh, splits? Basically, we don't see the pinch by design anymore. What we see are pinches by opportunity. You still need to pinch, you still need to capture material. But after you break into the four rotor in 1942, the need diminishes because you're already in and there doesn't appear to be anything new on the horizon with the Germans. So as a result now, you will continue to stock the shelf but you will do it at the tail end of other operations, including the invasions of North Africa, Sicily, and of course, Normandy. The unit that was born at Dieppe, the 30th Assault Unit, also plays a role on D-Day and in the Normandy campaign. So David, there's still always more to learn about this subject, but you've taken us through this step by step. The Dieppe raid remains an incredibly important part of Canadian history. It's just that perhaps the reasons for it need to be addressed again and re looked at with a fresh, with a fresh lens. 
Well, without a doubt, I mean, this is the beauty of history. And we never know 100% about everything. So as a result, it is revisionary by nature. We're going to find new evidence. We're going to find new understandings as we go. And that is particularly the case when it comes to Dieppe and its connection to Normandy. Well, this has been absolutely fascinating, David. Uh, for those who are watching this and want to find out more, there is your book. There's more online. And Indy and Spartacus, I hope we've addressed some of the questions you had there. So yes, Dieppe does have a connection with the landings in Normandy, but it's not the one we think it is. And there's actually a much more important story that involves the Battle of the Atlantic and the need for the Allies to gain an upper hand in terms of intelligence and knowing what the Germans are doing. Speaking of spying, intelligence, deception, and fortitude, one of the most important spies in the Double Cross game was Garbo. Take it away, Astrid. If you think that German commands doubt that today is the actual invasion will be over by tomorrow, you are mistaken. The doubts will go on and one man will be at the heart of it. A man who will have to claim to fame to be the one of only two operatives in this war to be decorated for his service, the same service from both sides. The other is another favorite of mine, Agent Zigzag. But that is a story for another day. In any case, our man today will be awarded the Iron Cross by Hitler and King George will make him a member of the Order of the British Empire, in both cases for his extraordinary service during the Normandy campaign. Now, that is clever. He is Juan Pujol Garcia. Uh, here he is. He is from Spain, but lives in quiet suburban London with his wife and son. His neighbors think nothing of the polite little Spaniard who catches the tube into town every day to work at the BBC. Little do they know that Senor Pujol is hard at work to secure the success of D-Day and the freedom of Europe. Pujol hates fascism after his experience during the Spanish Civil War. When the World War begins, he thinks to himself, I must do something, something practical. I must make my contribution towards the good of humanity. He wants to spy for the British, but the Brits turn him down. Two more tries with the same result lead to another idea. Why not simply start working for the Germans? Gain their trust, learn their secrets, and then hand it all over to the British. So, Pujol contacts the Germans. He will later write, I began to use my gift of gab and rented away as befitted a stout Nazi and Francoist. The Abwehr chief in Madrid, Karl Erich Kühnthal, is convinced. In July 1941, Pujol is sent to Lisbon to make his merry way to Britain to train and recruit a network of spies. In Lisbon, he tries the British again and again, has no success. But if the Germans want him to spy, he'll spy for them. Maybe he can cause some chaos. He stays in Portugal pretending he is in Britain. Think of that. He uses guidebooks dictionaries, newspapers, magazine articles to simply make stuff up. Reports that are also full of errors, really obvious ones. Pujol can't get to grip with the imperial measurements of inches, feet and miles of British currency with its 12 pence in a shilling and 20 shillings in a pound. In one report, he tells his handlers that there are men in Glasgow who will do anything for a liter of wine, while Scots drink in pints, and it is seldom wine, right? Fortunately, Kuta is as ignorant of British measurements and money as he is of Scottish drinking habits. Over the next nine months, he heaps praise on the new star spied codename Agent Arabel. So, 
The British Code Breakers at Bletchley Park are reading the back and forth between Pujol and the up there as well. MI5's people are baffled by all the weirdness in the reports. This spy is either a moron or a fantasist, but the Germans are eating it all up. Then, in February 1942, Araceli, Pujol's wife, has had enough of the British denials. She explains the situation to an American naval attaché in Portugal, who tells MI6. After a typical British inter-service battle, Tar Robertson and MI5 emerge victorious, and Agent Arabelle is finally a double agent. They christen him Garbo, hmm? after Greta Garbo, because he's the best actor in the world. Over the next two years, Garbo and his handler Tommy Harris invent an intricate web of fictional sub-agents scattered across Britain at all levels of society. Okay, to name just a few. There is, for example, a Venezuelan in Glasgow, a violent anti-Soviet South African and a Welsh nationalist who supposedly leads some sort of Aryan Brotherhood. Over the course of the war, they sent over 300 letters written in secret ink at over 1,200 wireless transmissions. Garbo crowns his credibility with the Germans when he sends an accurate warning of Operation Torch in November 42. MI5 ensures that it arrives too late to be used, but the Abwehr loves him for it. Clever, right? By the end of 43, messages from Garbo have top priority for forwarding to Berlin. Then, in February 44, Garbo's fictional den of spies goes to work on Operation Fortitude. His men in Scotland support Fortitude North by reporting that elements of the fictional British Fourth Army are getting ready to invade Norway. They report troop sightings in Dundee and major naval exercises on the Clyde. In the south, his Welsh nationalists report that the fake 1st United States Army Group is assembling near Dover to invade Calais. All of which is supported by the physical deception and other double-cross agents. Finally, in the early hours of June 6, so today, comes Garbo's most important contribution. You see, he will be crucial in the days and weeks after today, after D-Day. It will be Garbo's job to keep up the ruse that today is a decoy and real threat is still aimed at the Pas de Calais. The Allies hope that this will keep the Germans from reinforcing Normandy. At three o'clock this morning, Garbo warned his German handlers that the invasion fleet was sailing. Again, too late for the Germans to do anything. And the German radio operator is not at his post anyway. True to his cunning and ability to improvise, Garbo turns this to his advantage. The radio operator comes on air at 8 a.m. and receives the message. By then, of course, it's obvious that Garbo was telling the truth. And now he twists the knife. He scolds his handlers. This makes me question your seriousness and your sense of responsibility. I cannot accept excuses or negligence. Were it not for my ideals and my faith, I would abandon this work. Kulental's reply is to grovel for forgiveness, praise the Spaniard and his network, and beg him to continue spying. Garbo has the Nazis eating out of his palm of his hand. So much so that after the war, he will fear that any surviving Nazis, when they discover he has duped them so completely, will try to kill him. So he convinces MI5 to help him fake his own death and disappear. It will take almost four decades until his story becomes public. Then, finally, Garbo 
will follow the man he helped today to the coast of Normandy. At the 40th anniversary of D-Day in 1984, he gets to see the sights of the battle that he worked so hard to cloak in confusion. Now that we've looked at an operation that served up, or at least was believed to have served up many valuable lessons, there's one fairly small but very significant action that we have not had time to cover that served up a great many lessons for a great many years to come. The assault on Brecourt Manor by Easy Company, 2nd Battalion of the 506 PIR, 101st Airborne Division under Captain Dick Winters. Its execution will be taught as a schoolbook case of an outflanking maneuver in decades to come. So, before we return for the 22nd hour of D-Day, let's take a closer look at that. This morning, Andy talked briefly about the Allied assault on the gun battery at Brecourt Manor. But the way it was captured, the ground tactics, the flanking, were so impressive that we thought we'd shine a spotlight on it now as the day heads towards its close. One of the few senior German commanders present in Normandy to witness the seaborne invasion firsthand is Colonel Friedrich Freiherr von der Heite of the 6th Parachute Regiment. He had one battalion stationed in and around saint mary glise another in Carentan, and the third at saint marie du mont from the latter, von der Heite watched the invasion unfolding on Utah Beach. Then he drove his motorcycle a couple of kilometers to the north until he came across an old chateau called Brecourt Manor. The 6th Battery of the 90th German Regimental Artillery had placed a battery of four 105mm howitzers here, but the precision had been abandoned. Von der Heide, determined to bring the big guns back into action, went to find himself some artillerymen and ordered his men to occupy the Brecourt. I don't need to go into the scattered American airborne drops again, I think, but for my purposes now, by 6 a.m., Lieutenant Dick Winters with 12 men and two officers have met up with Lieutenant Colonel Robert Strayer of the 2nd Battalion 506th at Le Grand Chemin Ridge. With dawn breaking and the invasion underway, they can hear the warships off the coast hurling their large shells against the beach defenses. Some even surge over their heads and towards targets further inland. Strayer spent the night trying to link up with as many elements of his outfit as possible. By now, he has around 200 men. Winter's small band is welcome reinforcements, but Strayer still finds himself in a rather tricky position. On the one hand, he wants to defend Le Grand Chemin against German counterattacks. On the other, he cannot ignore the enemy gun position. On the third hand, there is also his own D-Day objective, taking Saint-Marie-du-Mont. Moving towards the junction of roads D913 and D14, the small column is startled by the roar of large caliber guns. This is then accompanied by the distinct staccato sound of bursts of an MG42, making the Americans duck for cover at the road embankment. There is definitely fire coming their way from the tree line about 350 meters to the right flank. Strayer orders Lieutenant Kelly and D Company to clear it out. Kelly, however, makes the mistake of leading his men in a charge without scouting the area first. So D Company gets pinned down and has to scramble before they can break off contact with the enemy. Seeing Kelly scrambling back, Strayer turns to Winters and Easy Company to do the job. The first thing Winters does is order his men to drop all equipment except for ammunition and grenades, all they can carry. Then Winters takes it upon himself to conduct a hasty reconnaissance of the terrain ahead. Crawling along a hedgerow, Winters moves into a position from where he can peer into the enemy position. He is not surprised that intelligence failed to spot them. The tree-lined ditch is about 400 meters long, with a hedgerow separating two fields, and the thick bushes and trees offer perfect camouflage from the air. The L-shaped trench runs along 500 meters of hedgerow until intersected by another hedgerow perpendicularly from the left. The big guns have been rolled into the ditch until their giant wheels rest against the earthen walls. Three-face Utah Beach, about five kilometers away, the fourth towards the causeway a couple hundred meters off. In between are several machine guns. The Germans are clearly aware of the presence of American paratroopers in the area. 12,000 men are hard to miss. 
The battery commander must have been informed about the approach of the 2nd Battalion, for he has moved his machine guns to face several directions, yet they have neglected to send out men to spot the Americans approaching them. The risk now is definitely high, but taking out a whole battery of heavy German howitzers is an opportunity Winters cannot pass up. Making his way back to his company, Winters then quickly lays out his plan. A frontal attack is foolish, as the machine guns would make short work of their approach, but if they can hit the enemy in the flanks and infiltrate his trench lines, then they can take out one gun at a time without facing the brunt enemy force. This would also prevent them from being pinned down like Kelly's forces were. Speed is everything. We've got to hit them hard and fast and get into that trench before they can react. Then we'll concentrate on the first gun, take it, then attack the rest one by one. Winter's plan is a double envelopment. To achieve this, he divides his detachment into two assault groups, the first led by him, the other by Lieutenant Buck Compton. While one of their two machine guns moves into a position to cover their approach, Compton leads his group along the hedgerow towards the German flank. When they get close, he orders Sergeants Lipton and Rennie to a concealed position from where they too can provide covering fire, while he and Sergeants Garnier and Malarkey get as close as possible to the first gun position. Meanwhile, Winters takes the direct approach and leads his group, Corporal Toy, PFC Wynn and Private Lorraine over the open field, press down to the dirt. They are spotted and fired upon, but make it to another hedgerow. Here, Winters positions the second machine gun. While waiting for Compton to attack, he then works his way along the hedgerows, then suddenly spots a German helmet sticking out from the trench in front of him. The sound of his M1 signals Compton's group to hurry, and they throw grenades into the enemy position. Winters' group gives them covering fire as best they can before following them into the assault. The grenades knock out the machine gun crew, but heavy fire comes from the tree line on the other side. As Compton and his men jump into the trench, they surprise the Germans, loading their artillery piece. Compton surges forward, Tommy gun in hand, but when he pulls the trigger, nothing happens. The firing pin of the gun is broken. Luckily for him, Garnier is right behind him, pushes past and open fire. Compton drops his gun and throws a grenade. That was my first kill. I have no idea who he was, what he did outside of war, or if he had a wife or family. You just don't think. A man is trying to kill you and you either kill him first or be killed waiting to assess the situation. The Germans not killed by Compton's grenade are too stunned to react effectively, so only PFC Wynn is wounded. Yet the fight for the gun positions has just begun. Winters and Compton lead their men in an aggressive push down the trenches. Firing their Tommy guns and M1 rifles, they spray the Germans, and the gunners quickly abandon their positions in terror. The whole first gun position engagement has taken less than a minute. Winter scans the connecting trenches that lead to the second gun position. Any time now, the Germans must surely react to their assault and try to stop them. Expecting a counterattack, I flopped down and gazed down the connecting trench to the second gun position. And sure enough, there were two Germans setting up a machine gun. I got the first shot and hit the gunner in the hip. My second shot caught the other soldier in the shoulder. By that time, the rest of the men were in position, so I directed Toy and Compton to provide supporting fire in the direction of the second gun. The enemy is clearly alerted to their presence now. While the American machine guns pour fire into the German positions, Winters takes the initiative and leads five men into the assault. I decided that if we moved quickly and laid a strong base of fire support, the assault team would only be exposed for a minimal amount of time. Leaving three men at the first gun to maintain support fire, we then charged the next position with grenades and lots of yelling and firing. The splintering shrapnel and explosive force of their hand grenades takes down most of the German defenders, and they take the second position and capture six prisoners. Scared German soldiers have their hands in the air yelling, No make me dead! No make me dead! The paratroopers are by now running low on ammunition and grenades. Without knowing how many Germans are still left, Winters feels that his small band is overstretched. The reinforcements he requested have still not arrived, so he sends a runner back. They wait about half an hour, bracing themselves for a possible German counterattack, until the battalion's machine gunners arrive with two soldiers from another company. By now, Winters has a plan to take out the third gun. He will once more lead from the front. Lipton will recall. 
with fire into their positions from both flanks, heavy machine gun fire into their front, and Lieutenant Winters leading an assault right into their defenses. The Germans apparently felt that they were being hit by a larger force. Those defending the first gun broke and withdrew in disorganization to a far tree line. And that gun was in our hands. We did it so quick, so fast, they thought an entire company was attacking. Taking one man killed, the 12 paratroopers now control three of the four howitzers. Going back to the second gun site, Winters finds a case full of documents and maps that show the German gun positions all over the Cotentin Peninsula. This is fantastic intelligence, and he immediately sends the papers back to battalion headquarters, along with the German prisoners they've taken, and a second request to send him some ammunition and reinforcements. As the men begin destroying the German radios, telephones, and rangefinders, Captain Hesters turns up with three blocks of TNT. Now they can destroy the howitzers and keep them out of German hands in case of a successful counterattack. They drop a block of TNT down each barrel, followed by a German hand grenade. Like half-peeled bananas, the howitzers' barrels blow out. And as the third gun blows, their reinforcements arrive. Lieutenant Ronald Spears of D Company with five men. Spears' approach to the fourth gun is aggressive and straightforward, running through the trenches and firing into the German positions. This leaves two in his outfit wounded and one killed. With the last gun emplacement cleared out, the only thing left to do is direct an assault against Brecourt Manor itself, right? But a good leader knows when to call it quits. With their job done, the guns destroyed, and a piece of vital intel recovered, Winters decides to withdraw. The manor itself still has to be taken out sooner or later, but there is no point in trying it now with his small band of men. The Germans most likely have their well-concealed machine guns sighted onto the open ground beyond the artillery emplacements, just waiting for the Americans to try and cross it. Winters orders some mortar shells lobbed against the manor and withdraws. The assault on Brécourt Manor is a prime example of excellent small unit tactics. Easy Company was like a well-oiled machine, and with superb training and Winter's natural leadership skills, they proved superior to an entrenched defender. Winters used the terrain to his advantage, allowing the paratroopers to launch the assault at close range and from different directions at once. Once inside the trenches, they moved in typical stormtrooper fashion, tackling the guns in short sweeps with overwhelming firepower and coordination. Later this afternoon, Winters and his men returned to Bricourt Manor with 30 more men and tanks. They drive the Germans out, securing the manor for good.